Okay. Um, so my name is Kirsten Ibelacko, and next to me here is Michael Kavanaugh. We're working on a project called the Ghost Rockets. Um, for the last four and a half years, we've been working on a documentary. What happened? Am I leaning on it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, a documentary about an organization called UFO Sweden. So it's a personal documentary, and we're following the members as they're investigating Swedish UFO cases. Uh, the film is actually premiering later today uh, at 5 o'clock at Victoria, if anyone is interested. The Ghost Rockets project consists of two parts. It's both a documentary and it's also a transmedia experience. And today we will be focusing almost only on the transmedia experience. And we will share a little bit about the process, how it came about, our inspiration, uh, and also run you through a sneak peek of a prototype of the transmedia parts that we're building at the moment. But to give you a little bit of a background into the project as a whole, we would like to start with just sharing the trailer for the documentary. Ja, och platsen är en fin spång, en sjö som heter Mäsen. Och det är två personer som såg ett eh, civilflygplan som passerar västerut vid den här tidpunkten. Och framför det, och lite ovanför, så är det ett trekantigt föremål. Mörkt sånt som färdas med flygplanet. Jag lyssnar på allting, vi undersöker allting. Jag söker svaren, och alla svar är bra svar. Det är tusentals olika fenomen och rapporter som, som jag har stött på sedan tidigt 70-tal och undersökt och vänt och vridit på och oftast kunnat hitta förklaringarna på också. Men det finns ju ett fenomen som har hängt med liksom hela tiden och det är spökraketerna. Det är inte 1946 och det året såg man över tusen små raketer i Sverige. Stort intresse utomlands. Folk frågar ofta vad var det egentligen? Vad var det folk såg? Ja, men pappren har ju legat där i, i många, många årtionden. Ja, nu är det avhemligat. Men det är avhemligat. För det var ju spökraketkommittén då som jobbade med att hitta förklaringen. Och de hittade aldrig någon förklaring? Nej, de gjorde ju inte det. Och det här var ju då, kan man säga, början på en våg av rapporter som sen har pågått än in i våran tid. Och i den här... Högen av rapporter så finns då det som Bo och Liss observerade. Nu hörde vi det här ljudet ovanför oss att det, som, ja, som det låter när ett flygplan kommer åkande utan att gasa liksom, utan helt... Det här väsande ljud. Vi tänkte på det som en, en kryssningsmissil som hade kommit fel från Sovjet. Alltså så tänkte vi. Men sen var det ju att den bromsade ju in och vände. Och sen landade i sjön och sjönk. Och det var ju fullt, det var ju fullt med fåglar på så att det liksom brr, brr, flög upp en massa fåglar. Och sen såg man ju... Det, var... det kraschade ju inte utan det landade och sjönk. Vilket då gör att det kan ligga kvar intakt där. Ja okej, okay. vad innebär 270? Är det längden eller? Ja det är längden. Mm. Jag tror de har tänkt sig lite grann på att komma och fiska i fjällen och sånt där. Ja det passar ju perfekt. Ja det är typ det. Vi ska göra. Det finns fler problem, ja. men det är två saker som går Det ena är transport av utrustning, så att få grejerna på plats. Det andra är att vi inte har några lyckade. Så det här är ju då kanske en pusselbit till lösningen av den största UFO-gåtan i världen som jag ser. Spökraketvågen 46 och det som hände efteråt. Att vara ensam. Det är det värsta som kan inträffa för en människa. Och för en mänsklighet att stå ensam kan vara minst lika hemskt. Att tro det är en sak. Och att veta är en helt annan sak. Det 
stars in the projector aren't part of our design, but they suit, so it's, it works out. So as you can see um, in, in the trailer, our main character, Class Sun, he's trying to solve this mystery called the Ghost Rockets. And the Ghost Rockets is a, a Scandinavian mystery, which I um, found out about through UFO Sweden. It began in 1946 with a, with a wave of sightings. Um, and there was many people across, a few hundred people across Sweden all seeing the same type of thing over a very short period of time. And of these objects, they were maneuvering and landing into the lakes and sinking down into the water. And uh, they're still being seen, the same sort of objects still being seen uh, even today. But back in 1946, the Swedish military uh, felt obligated to try and find out what they were. So they set up this uh, special investigation committee. Um, and this is uh, a man called Carl Jester Basten. He's the head of the committee. And he's, uh, th they basically went out to all the different lakes and they scanned the, the lakes trying to find these actual objects. Uh, but the only thing they could find was these like impact craters and plants that had been torn off. And they felt convinced that something was landing there, but they were unable to see what it was. They never worked out what it was. Um, so it's an interesting mystery. But they, they never s uh, actually, I think we've got a, a short clip. We, we found an interview with, um, with this man. I think it's the only known interview. Uh, Klaas Svan actually did it back in the 80s. So we made this really short teaser to sort of uh, introduce the Ghost Rockets mystery, which will play. It goes for less than a minute. Yeah, let's just see. Skulle ni också försöka gömma undan det för civilbefolkningen på något sätt? Vi sa oss inte, men det är kunde inte hitta ett enda metallfragment. Jo, vi förstod inte hur vi kunde undgå att finnas. Var det någonsin någon tvekan om att något som hade slagit ner? Det var aldrig någon tvekan om det. It's a, a little teaser clip of basically all of the things that we aren't doing in our documentary. But uh, Kirsten will talk about that. Um, uh, so they didn't find any explanation. But what they did do is they left behind uh, a huge archive, uh, which has actually been stored here at Riks uh in Stockholm. And uh, we, uh, we, s we saw the archive, and we fell in love with it completely. It was just these. just thousands of pages of these uh, documents, reports, witness statements, correspondence between governments, all discussing this ghost rockets. And uh, they're all collated, so this entire archive section was just to do with the ghost rockets. So, uh, and you know, we fell in love with them. This, like, each one of them told its own little story. Uh, but we didn't know what to do with them. It's like, what do we do with 3,000 pages uh, of UFO archive? Um, I had a feeling that this type of these type of UFO archives were sort of the type of content that people were interested in. I remembered back in uh, 2007 or something, the Ministry of Defence in the UK had released the, some government UFO files, and it made headlines all across the world. So people wanted to know wh what is it the governments are doing with these weird topics and. And another recent example, just from uh, just from this year, actually, is another 130,000 pages from I think it was Project Blue Book got released and uh, caused a stir again. It's like, but we, again, we we're just sort of faced with this problem. It's like, what do we do with 130,000 pages, or in our case, 3,000 pages of information? What, what can we do with it? So we started to look for ways we can make the content more meaningful. And we found an example uh, by the Guardian newspaper who 
uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, got access to the uh, members of parliament's expense receipts. And there's a couple hundred thousand pages of expense receipts. And uh, instead of going through them themselves, they published the, the entire a uh, lot of them on the internet and ask their readers to find the information in the expense receipts for them. They look for suspicious transactions and it's extremely popular. I mean, who wouldn't want to try and get someone in trouble by finding some suspicious receipts? So we got inspired by that and we started thinking, well, how can we, let's, maybe we should do something with this uh, Ghost Rockers archive. Maybe we can make, let you know, people go through it themselves and see if they can find some, something, uh, some clues, some patterns. Uh, so that was uh, quite a few years ago now, and uh, since then we've been um, building uh, what we call the Ghost Rockets Investigation Portal. Um, so I think today I'm going to try and show you <laughs> uh, how it's going to look. It's uh, not um, released to the public yet, um, and it's not fully functioning. We're having some problems with the... Uh, a database that was created in the 1980s by UFO Sweden, and it's just trying to sort out all the corruption in it. Um, it's uh, Google Chrome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I'm going to run you through how it looks now, uh, and uh, maybe you can see the potential. I, I don't really know if you know you're supposed to show something in such a rough state. I guess it's kind of like showing a film that isn't finished yet, but. Um, We'll, uh, we'll just do it anyway and see what happens. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the Ghost Rockets investigation portal. And this is the front page here. And here you can see a little uh, video that you saw before, which will be uh, a teaser um, explaining what the Ghost Rockets mystery is. Uh, to right here, we'll see, you can see some popular theories. Uh, popular documents, um, and down the bottom here, we're going to have a call to action. Uh, so help us solve the Ghost Rockets mystery. Um, it was important for us that uh, we're actually asking people to do genuine things that can genuinely actually help solve the Ghost Rockets mystery. It's not a gamified or curated experience. It's just a way of accessing real information and trying to make sense of real information. Um, so to do that, uh, we are going to ask uh, our audience to do two primary things, and at least initially, and that is uh, to tag information in the documents themselves. So we're looking for little bits of uh, date, time, direction, uh, little bits of information like that. And the other thing that we would like our audience to do is to help us clean up the translation of the documents. So we've scanned all 3,000 pages. They've had an OCR pass done on them. Uh, and it's a little bit rough. Uh, but uh, I'll quickly show you how it's going to look. So there's many different ways to actually browse the archive itself. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, so on, a, uh, on your left here, you can see the actual documents themselves, and you can just browse through them. You can go to the next unseen document and just look at the documents and read through them randomly that way if you, if you choose to. Uh, but next to the documents will always be this uh, uh, prompt box asking you to fill in bits of bits, any information that you happen to see in the document itself. Uh, when was it published, uh, what place, what country was it published, uh, as well as uh, details about the actual observation. So if you read the page itself, uh, it's usually a will usually be a report or a collection of reports where people will say they saw something at a specific time and it landed. Uh, so we're asking people to tag that information and enter it in so we can uh, collate all these little bits of uh, clues. Uh, and there's quite a bit of it, uh, information that we can try to gather from the documents um, in a standard report. We work closely with UFO Sweden to ask how they gather information and what are the key factors. To, um, and some of it was intuitive and some of it was not intuitive, actually. So we spent a long time working out what points of information uh, is important to get from, from each document. Uh, 
as well as, as uh, tagging information is the, the translating part here as well. So this is actually the second page of the document. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is uh, actually, um, I did this yesterday, I copied and pasted uh, this and into Google Translate, and this is what I got uh, to the right. So this was actually a good example of the OCR kind of working, and it kind of makes sense. It's a, you need a Swedish person to, to go through and co correct and smooth this out. But the idea being that the more of the pages that are translated and the more people that have gone through and, uh, and cleaned up the translation, uh, the more accessible this uh, foreign government's archive is to an international community. Um, yeah, so what's the point of gathering all of these little bits of clues is that it allows us to, um, to map all of these little data points on, in a more visual way, a way that you can sort of grasp or, and, and, do, and work with. And uh, we spoke to UFO Sweden a lot, and they, they seem quite sure that the way they work is they'll often get a map, and they'll look to see what directions, if there's some sort of pattern. So that's the way we thought we would work here. Uh, so the idea being the more information that's tagged in the documents themselves, the more that actually shows up here. And what you're looking at now is actually um, things that UFO Sweden have done themselves uh, from 1980s upwards. And each one of these uh, little tags represents uh, a document or a collection of documents. Um, not all of the documents have been processed, so that's what it's a crowdsourced investigation. We need the audience to tag little bits of information, and the more they tag, the more uh, information will show up here. Uh, and the idea being you'll be able to search through this information uh, using um, the data points that we're collecting with the ultimate goal being perhaps you'd be able to see some sort of correlation or pattern or, um, or yeah, collection of bits and pieces of information that lead to some sort of conclusion. I'm getting some hints here that we, uh, we need to finish off. So I just want to say, uh, to finish this off, that the Ghost Rockets project is one project, but it's, we consider it to be two projects within, and the film has one budget and separate financiers, so the transmedia experience have separate financiers. We have, for example, Innovative Culture sitting here today that has been kindly to support us with this. Um, for us, this is an interesting experiment in how to open up archives. Our society has a lot of archives and a lot of history residing in archives. And I know that there's a lot of digitization processes going on, but we wanted to see what happens if you take a topic or a course and you have a quite dedicated audience like UFO geeks around the world. What happens if you let them dig into an archive and help around an issue? And we have been talking about how to create business models around this, and maybe this is something, a tool that could work for many other types of experiences. Uh, but at the moment, Ghost Rockets is like a little test where we want to see how could this work, and then we'll take it from there, I think. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Thank you.